October. Yep. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by paying tribute to the incredible life and legacy of Doddy Weir, who sadly passed away on Saturday. During his fight to find a cure for motor neuron disease, Doddy has been an inspiration to all of us with his bravery, his infectious optimism and his love of life. Uh, and my thoughts are with Doddy's wife, Cathy, their sons, Hamish, Angus and Ben, and their wider family and friends. Scotland has lost a true sporting legend and a champion in the fight against motor neuron disease. Uh, Presiding officer, in the last week, a uh, United Nations expert on violence against women offered to provide expertise to the First Minister on the Gender Recognition Bill. Uh, Rima Salim raised concerns that the bill would potentially open up the door for violent males to abuse the process of acquiring a gender certificate. Her report states, and I quote, this presents potential risks to the safety of women in all their diversity, including women born female, trans women, and gender non-conforming women. Last night, the Scottish Conservatives asked Parliament to simply acknowledge the report of the UN Rapporteur, but the First Minister voted against it. First Minister, why can't you accept the concerns raised by the United Nations Special Rapporteur? First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, can I also take the opportunity to pay tribute to the life and legacy of Doddy Weir? He was a hero on uh, the rugby pitch, but he was perhaps even more so an inspiration off of the rugby pitch. Uh, there is, of course, a question later in this session of FMQs that will allow me to pay more fulsome tribute to Doddy. Uh, but for now, uh, let me say that my thoughts and condolences are with his wife, children and all of his loved ones. Um, on the specific issue, uh, not only do we acknowledge the comments uh, made, it's not a UN report, these were comments by a UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, not only have we acknowledged that those comments have been made, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has written a substantial response to them. Uh, I believe that response can be found on the Scottish Parliament uh, website because it was sent to the Equalities Committee, which of course is the lead committee uh, on this bill. Of course, a number of organisations uh, representing uh, women who suffer uh, male violence and abuse, including Rape Crisis Scotland, and Scottish Women's Aid uh, have been part uh, of a number of organisations who have responded as well and have set out uh, in a, a number of respects why they disagree uh, with those comments. Um, I take the safety of women and girls uh, very seriously, perhaps more seriously than any uh, other issue, as I'm sure all of us do. I've spent uh, much of my adult life and indeed all of my years in public office uh, seeking to do things along with others to help advance the rights of women and girls and to ensure better protection for women and girls uh, against male violence. Uh, of course, any uh, man who wants to abuse a woman, uh, certainly in my experience, and I think this will be shared by many across the chamber, uh, do not need uh, to in some way pretend to be a woman yeah. in order to do so. Yeah. And any who uh, did feel that need, of course, don't need a gender recognition certificate. Our focus as a parliament, our focus as a society uh, should be on those who perpetrate violence against women and girls. Uh, and that is men, uh, not all men, of course, uh, but it is men who abuse women and that should be our focus. In taking on these issues and debating these issues fully and respectfully, which I believe is really important, what we should not do, in my view, is further stigmatise a group in society, a very small minority Marginal. in society, who are already perhaps the most marginalised and stigmatised group in society. I'm, of course, talking about trans people. In any group of society um, where there are bad faith actors, we deal with them. We don't stigmatise the entire yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that very strongly as well. Yeah. Dr. Frost. I'm not then sure from the First Minister's answer why she couldn't have voted for the Conservative amendment yesterday, which simply asked, 
simply ask Parliament to acknowledge that report from the Special Rapporteur, which the Cabinet Secretary has responded to, yet the First Minister and the majority of SNP MSPs couldn't support that. But, but let's just have a look at the valid concerns that have been raised by this expert. Reem Asaleem says, and I uh, quote, the efforts to reform existing legislation by the Scottish Government do not sufficiently take into consideration the specific needs of women and girls, particularly those at risk of male violence and those who have experienced male violence. To prevent the risk of attacks on women, my Scottish Conservative colleague Russell Finlay submitted an amendment to ban convicted sex offenders from changing gender, but the Scottish Government voted that amendment down. So why does the First Minister believe that a convicted male sex offender should be able to change their gender when there is a risk that they will exploit the system to attack women? First Minister. Well, firstly, not only has the Cabinet Secretary responded um, in detail to the comments of the Special Rapporteur, and I, I would encourage all members and all members of the public uh, with an interest here to read those comments because it sets out very clearly why, respectfully, we do not believe uh, that these concerns are well-founded, um, and uh, that sets uh, out the reasons for that very fully and very clearly. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will also meet with the Special Rapporteur next week uh, to discuss these concerns in more detail. And of course, this is a bill uh, that has not only gone through two uh, public consultations, is currently going through very extensive parliamentary scrutiny. And in terms of stage, well, in terms of stage uh, two of the bill, um, a number of amendments uh, have been passed, uh, and that has responded uh, to a number of the concerns that have been raised uh, with members across all sides of this chamber. Uh, there are some amendments that the Cabinet Secretary will have set out again very fully and very clearly to the committee uh, why the government could not uh, support those amendments um, and the reasons for that. And of course, it's for the committee uh, then to vote and to decide on these matters. And ultimately, it will be for this parliament as a whole uh, to reach decisions at stage three, which of course we will reach uh, before uh, the end of this parliamentary session. Um, these are uh, difficult issues that, that people have difficult, uh, that have strong views on, um, on different aspects of this. I think it's really important that we engage seriously, that we engage respectfully, that we engage in detail, um, and that we remember all of us, all of us see protecting women and girls as a priority, but I hope all of us uh, also see protecting the rights of trans people as important too. Um, and actually, I feel that part of my duty is to set out clearly why I do not believe, having considered in great depth all of these issues over a long period of time, why I do not believe these objectives are conflicting. Um, in fact, uh, I believe that it is important we advance both of these things, and that is what the government is seeking to do. Douglas Ross. I, I, I agree with the First Minister that, that we have to treat this with the seriousness and, and respect it deserves and look into detail with these things. But again, I asked a very simple question as to why the government couldn't support Russell Finlay's amendment, uh, and we got no answer on that. I think we should surely all be able to agree that convicted male sex offenders should never be able to change their gender. Uh, this is not about trans people. These people are criminals, and that is exactly what Russell Finlay uh, was trying to stop. But the First Minister is also trying to say that the government has dealt with this issue, but the UN expert says differently. The Special Rapporteur said this. The Scottish Government does not sell out, spell out how it will ensure a level of scrutiny for the applications made to acquire a gender recognition certificate. Other governments that have adopted a self-identification procedure for the legal recognition of a gender identity have done so. So other governments did the necessary work before changing the law, but the First Minister hasn't. And right now, there are live court cases that could have a material impact on this bill. The UN expert says the government should, as a minimum, await the outcome of the judgments on these very issues in front of both Scottish and UK courts. 
So the First Minister said this bill is currently going through extensive scrutiny. Therefore, surely, First Minister, you must agree to pause the bill until we've heard these legal judgments. First Minister, it's ultimately for, for Parliament uh, to determine whether or not a bill passes uh, through this chamber. Um, on the issue of sex offenders, um, let me set out uh, in more detail the reasoning uh, for the government's position on that particular amendment. Uh, current provisions for management of sex offenders are robust and effective. However, uh, we will expand, and this has been made clear during stage two, we will expand the reporting requirements to include notification about an application for gender recognition. Um, it's important to point out that under the existing process in the 2004 Gender Recognition Act, there is no requirement that uh, an applicant must be uh, what that amendment would have uh, required. Uh, and the amendments lodged by Russell Finlay, uh, our consideration is that they would not be compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Yep. So while we think that the processes for sex offender notification requirements are already working well. Notwithstanding that, the Scottish Government has made clear that before the Gender Recognition Reform Bill is commenced, we will introduce legislation to amend the sex offender notification requirements to include notification about an application for a gender recognition certificate. So we are taking these issues seriously, but we are seeking to proceed in a way that will ensure the bill is compliant with the European Convention on human rights. Uh, and we have been open to other amendments uh, put forward, including uh, by uh, Jamie Green, a, a member of the Conservative group. On the comments uh, of the Special Rapporteur, we take these seriously. That is why we have responded in detail. But respectfully, we do not uh, believe that those criticisms are well founded. Um, and that's not uh, a view that we hold alone. Organisations that work day in and day out with women and girls Briefly, who are First subject Minister. to male violence, Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid uh, also uh, believe that uh, many of these criticisms uh, and concerns are not well founded. So we will continue to proceed carefully. Uh, there has been considerable consultation and considerable scrutiny of this bill, and that is right and proper. Douglas Ross. On the First Minister's uh, response on sex offenders, we know as a result of a Scottish Conservative Freedom of Information request that in the last three years in Scotland, more than uh, 500 times a sex offender has changed their name. So if they can change their name so easily and for the reasons they want to, why would they not also change their gender if this now becomes uh, easier as a result of this legislation? Uh, I also asked, and, and I know and I understand this was a complex issue, and the, the First Minister didn't the First Minister didn't mention the point about the live legal cases that are currently ongoing, for which the Special Rapporteur asked for this legislation to be delayed. Those ju judgments are crucial, and a delay would be sensible. It is far better that this Government and this Parliament makes good laws rather than quick laws. We want to make legislation with full and proper consideration of all of the implications. But for some reason, the government seems determined to rush ahead at full speed to put this bill through this month. The experts and women group, women's groups say could have potentially damaging consequences. Now, the First Minister said the Special Rapporteur's criticisms are not well formed. Rima Salim is a United Nations expert. She is a Special Rapporteur on violence against women and girls. I personally think very few people can speak with greater authority on women's safety. The Scottish Parliament, including the committee in charge of scrutinising this bill, has not had the chance to examine her evidence and hear from her in person, which the Cabinet Secretary will be doing. So will the First Minister agree today to pause this legislation so we can properly consider the findings of a leading global expert on this crucial matter? First Minister. Well, firstly, I cannot comment on live legal cases uh, and would be open to criticism if I did. Secondly, regardless of any individual's view on this legislation, uh, one thing that cannot be said uh, with any credibility or basis in fact is that it is being rushed through this Parliament. This process, through consultation, 
Uh, introduction of draft legislation, introduction of legislation, the uh, formal parliamentary scrutiny process has been underway now, I think, for a period of six years. This has not been rushed. Um, this has been done carefully and rightly so. Let me respond uh, before I come on to, uh, again, the issue of the UN Special Rapporteur, to the issue about registered sex offenders. It is the case already that registered sex offenders must, by law, notify the police of any change of name. Uh, that requirement applies to an individual, irrespective of what name they use or what gender uh, they identify uh, with, and that is important. Disclosure Scotland takes steps already to ensure that a person requesting a disclosure certificate does not succeed in avoiding the disclosure of any previous convictions by using a different name. So it's important to recognise the protections that are all already in place, that this bill does nothing to change. And many of the issues that are being talked about here, and many of the issues that are sparking concern, I accept, are not issues that are changed or impacted in any way by the detail of this specific legislation. Now, coming back to the Special Rapporteur, it is because we respect uh, that person and uh, the role they hold that we are treating uh, these concerns uh, so seriously. Uh, the response, and again, I would encourage every member to read the Cabinet Secretary's response on the Parliament's website. The Cabinet Secretary will meet the UN Special Rapporteur uh, next week. But there are other voices in this debate that also speak from a lot of experience and expertise, and it's not right to dismiss uh, them either, because they are people who work with women that are subject to male violence uh, every single day of uh, the week. Lastly, Presiding Officer, uh, given that we are speaking uh, about a UN Special Rapporteur, the reforms in this bill align with the stated position of the UN Human Rights Office that trans people should be recognised legally, and I'm quoting, through a simple administrative process that does not require medical diagnosis. And lastly, lastly, presiding officer, Scotland is not the first country in the world to make changes of this nature. Many other countries have done so. And as the Cabinet Secretary's response to the UN Special Rapporteur sets out, the concerns that are being raised in the context of our legislation it have not materialised in the experience of other countries who are ahead of us. So let's continue uh, to treat these issues seriously, respectfully and calmly, and allow Parliament to continue to do its job properly. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. I'd like to join others in paying tribute to the late Doddy Weir. It was clear throughout his life, both as a player and a campaigner, that he was a force to be reckoned with. He viewed his heartbreaking diagnosis of motor neuron disease as a call to action and bravely shared his story with the world, raising millions of pounds for that cause. He was an inspiration to us all and a champion for those battling MND and our thoughts are with his family and friends at this difficult time. Presiding officer, breast cancer chemotherapy in NHS Tayside has collapsed, leaving vulnerable women traveling across the country to receive life-saving treatment. At the root of the problem is a chemotherapy dosing scandal that has gone on for three and a half years. Yesterday, the Courier released a documentary where the women affected and grieving families demanded answers. We now know that nobody believes the conclusions of the reports commissioned by the First Minister's government. Patients don't believe them, the doctors don't believe them, and even the whistleblower who first raised the alarm described the conclusions of the reports as nothing more than a guess. For years, Labour has raised this issue and been dismissed by this government. So will the First Minister order an independent inquiry to restore confidence, to relaunch the service, and give patients and the public the facts they need. First Minister. Well, firstly, before responding uh, to the very serious issues that have been raised, can I say, first of all, that Anna Sarwar is wrong to describe the Tayside service as having collapsed. Uh, that neither comes close to accurately describing the current service, nor does it do anything to help any current patients or the dedicated doctors that are working within that centre. And let me illustrate that point, because it is a really important point for those, uh, particularly those in Tayside who might be watching this right now. Uh, there are around 150 new patients referred to Tayside breast services every week. Out of them, around seven will receive treatment in another centre. 
Uh, so it is just wrong, and I think shamefully wrong, to use the word collapsed to describe a service in which uh, doctors are working in a dedicated fashion, in which many uh, patients are being treated every single week. Um, in terms of the uh, issues about the review, these are serious issues. These are issues uh, that require to be assessed uh, by experts and by clinicians. Uh, I am not, and politicians uh, are not uh, clinicians with the expertise to reach uh, judgments ourselves on uh, these matters. I will look carefully at what has been reported today, as will the Health Secretary, and if there is further a further process of review that is necessary, we will not shy away from uh, taking that. Uh, the RCP review commissioned by NHS Tayside into prescribing practices up to early 2020 uh, uh, happened. The, the board will be implementing all of its uh, recommendation. That review looked at a random selection of case notes from before and after uh, the HIS review uh, and confirmed variation in practice against national norms, as the HIS review had already found, uh, but pointed to a range of improvements in practice uh, since then. And the authors of that RCP review included four oncologists, uh, and of course its findings aligned with previous published reviews, including that of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So we will continue to take these issues uh, seriously, uh, but we will also do so responsibly. Anna Sarwar. I, I would suggest the First Minister actually watches the documentary and listens to the stories of staff at NHS Tayside and the experiences of families. There are zero breast cancer oncologists in Tayside. Zero. If zero doesn't equate to collapse, then I'm not sure what definition the First Minister would use. And this does have consequences for staff. There is a workforce crisis across our NHS, but particularly felt here in Tayside. A recent Freedom of Information request showed there are nine vacancies in the oncology department, with the lead breast cancer consultant post now vacant for 839 days. That has consequences for patients too. Over 200 women have had to travel to other parts of the country to get their treatment. In February, the First Minister said this was unacceptable, but since then things are getting worse. The government's failure to get a grip of this crisis is putting women's lives at risk. At one of the most traumatic times in a woman's life, they are facing additional barriers to treatment and all the anxiety that comes with that. So can the First Minister tell us when local oncology services will be restored and can she guarantee that breast cancer oncology services have a future in Tayside? First Minister. Anna Sarwar asked about watching uh, the documentary. I will certainly uh, take the time to do that. But the Health Secretary hasn't just watched the documentary, he took part in the documentary. Uh, these issues are issues that all of us uh, take seriously. The Cabinet Secretary is meeting with the current clinical teams next week. And let me take the opportunity to assure patients in Tayside that they have a very committed and compassionate team of doctors that deliver excellent care. Uh, recruitment efforts are ongoing and indeed uh, there has been recent success in recu recruiting a consultant in colorectal uh, cancer in uh, Tayside. Uh, Tayside uh, NHS though works closely with oncology teams in the other four cancer centres across Scotland to ensure that patients who need treatment are prioritised uh, appropriately. And let me repeat what I said in my original answer. Yes, there are challenges in the Tayside service. Yes, there have been reviews that have been necessary. If there are further reviews, we will not shy away uh, from those and there is further work uh, to be done. But 150 new patients referred to Tayside breast services every week and of them, just seven have to go to another centre to receive treatment. So it does a disservice, uh, not, not to raise these issues. It is absolutely right to raise these issues. But it does do a disservice to those working uh, in that centre to describe it as being in a state of collapse, because that is not the case. Anna Sarwar. Uh, First Minister, the women in Tayside don't want to see the health secretary in a documentary. They want to see a breast cancer oncologist in Tayside. And that problem has still not been fixed. Uh, and I'm sorry, but the First Minister has said little today that will reassure women in Tayside and their families. We do have a failing cancer service, and that is, means staff are being let down women are being let down, and a First Minister who has no serious plan to restore services. And as per usual, Nicola Sturgeon keeps telling us that it is unacceptable, but then accept, expects patients to accept it anyway. And we've seen it again this week. 
Ambulances still queuing at a &E's. Elderly patients still waiting on trolleys for treatment. The longest waiting lists in history. Now over three quarters of a million Scots on an NHS waiting list. And women in Tayside being failed by the collapse of cancer services. First Minister, you are in charge of the NHS in Scotland. And you have been for 15 years. How long do Scots have to wait before you get to grips with this crisis and actually do your job? First Minister. I am in charge uh, as head of this government of the National Health Service, which is why I understand uh, that running the National Health Service, that resolving challenges and problems in the National Health Service takes more than glib soundbites in the chamber uh, of the Scottish Parliament. And has, as, they, as they have been throughout the entirety of the 15 years uh, that my party has been in government, the people of Scotland will be the ultimate and indeed the only judge uh, of whether or not uh, this government is trusted to continue uh, with its stewardship of the National Health Service. Um, all of these issues are taken seriously. It was uh, because of original concerns about potentially substandard care uh, that many of these issues uh, came to the fore. And I repeat again what I said, there is work to do here to ensure the sustainability and the ongoing quality uh, of cancer care uh, and breast cancer care in NHS Tayside. Uh, but the vast overwhelming majority of those referred into that service um, do not go for treatment to another centre. They get quality treatment uh, in NHS Tayside. And I say again, it does a disservice to that service uh, to suggest otherwise. And in terms of the wider points, uh, again, day in and day out, this government works to address the significant challenges that our NHS is under. So if we look at the if we look at the, the statistics published just this week, significant increase in the number of inpatient and day case patients seen uh, in the last quarter, a 7.3% increase. Uh, the referral to treatment target, uh, an increase in the number, uh, the percentage of those seen within 18 weeks, 72.5%, uh, and, and reductions of the longest waits in our National Health Service, a 20% reduction in outpatients and a 22% reduction uh, for inpatient and day cases. Uh, so we will continue to do the hard work of supporting our NHS uh, through these difficult times because that's our job, that's our responsibility, a responsibility given to us by the people of Scotland. Question number three, Gillian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As others have, I want to add the thoughts of my party to the tributes paid here to Dodie Ware. His legacy will not just be his rugby, but will be the honesty and bravery with which he faced his health condition and the incredible work he did in raising awareness and funding. I send the most sincere and heartfelt condolences to his family. Their bravery has never failed to astound me, and his sons in particular have been in my thoughts this week. It's awful to lose a parent, and they're so young. They've been amazing in accompanying their dad to events over the last few years, and I hope the whole family are getting the support they need. To ask the Scottish Government whether it recognises the harms caused by alcohol sports sponsorship to vulnerable groups such as young people and those in recovery. First Minister. Well, it is the case that alcohol advertising and promotion can encourage young people to drink alcohol and indeed act as a barrier for those in recovery. Restricting alcohol advertising and promotion is one of the World Health Organisation's three best buys to prevent and reduce alcohol-related harms. We have launched a public consultation setting out potential restrictions on a variety of methods of alcohol advertising, including on sports sponsorship. Uh, this consultation closes on the 9th of March next year, and I would encourage uh, anyone with an interest to respond. The Minister for Public Health will meet with key stakeholders, including sporting bodies, during the consultation period to hear about potential impacts and their views on these proposals. Julian Mackay. I thank the First Minister for that answer. It is well established that exposure to alcohol marketing is causally associated with the initiation of drinking, an increase in alcohol consumption and also an increased risk of relapse for those in recovery. Sports sponsorship provides alcohol companies with a prominent and highly attractive method of reaching a large audience, influencing how much and how often they consume alcohol. Does the Scottish Government recognise the need to implement restrictions on alcohol sports sponsorship as a public health measure to protect our population? First Minister. Uh, I think I, I said, and I would repeat what I said in my original answer, that I think it is uh, an important aspect of promoting uh, better public health and, of course, uh, discouraging young people from uh, drinking alcohol and making it more difficult uh, for people with alcohol misuse uh, issues 
uh, to recover from those. Um, in terms of sporting organisations, there are difficult issues involved. Of course, we would encourage uh, sporting organisations to diversify sponsorship away from the alcohol uh, industry. Um, I think it's because I do agree uh, very much uh, with the comments that Gillian Mackay has made uh, that we have embarked on this consultation. There are some complex issues involved in it, but it's important that we listen uh, to a wide range of people and, of course, key stakeholders, uh, which we will uh, do. This government has a good record in implementing uh, sometimes controversial policies, minimum pricing for alcohol, uh, to try to reduce the harm that we know alcohol can do. Um, and that's the spirit uh, in which we will take forward this consultation. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, if the Government is seeking to curtail the advertisement of any perceived enjoyment of drinking, then surely it must also raise public awareness of the harms of drinking as well. Especially at this time of year, we know that drinking under the influence offences have risen by 20% over the last decade, yet last year the conviction rate for those offences fell by a third year on year. Many cases have simply been dropped uh, due to delays in forensic testing. As we enter the festive period, aside from Police Scotland's own public awareness campaign as to around the dangers of drinking and driving, what is the Scottish Government doing itself to raise awareness of this important issue? And does the First Minister agree that these conviction rates are simply far too low? Yep. First Minister. Well, firstly, you know, we all recognise that drinking alcohol in moderation uh, can uh, be something, is something that many people uh, do and enjoy doing. Uh, what we need to discourage um, and what we need to address uh, are people uh, who have uh, a problem of alcohol misuse or drink alcohol in ways uh, that pose a danger to them and to others. Obviously, conviction rates for any offence are a matter for the courts and the independent prosecution authorities. Uh, of course, I want to uh, make sure that the government is doing everything to raise awareness, and we will, uh, as we approach this festive season, uh, as we do every year and beyond, uh, take steps uh, to continue to educate people about the dangers uh, of driving under the influence uh, of alcohol uh, and drugs, uh, of course. Uh, but in terms of making sure that people who do that are identified and prosecuted that's a matter for the independent authorities, but we want to ensure uh, that we have a zero tolerance uh, to that and the government will continue to support uh, those independent authorities in all ways that are appropriate. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact any proposed reduction in the number of overseas student visas will have on Scottish universities. First Minister. Scotland's universities, uh, world-class universities, do a fantastic job of attracting students from around the world, and that should be welcomed. Uh, the UK government, unfortunately, seems intent on jeopardising the internationalist outlook of our tertiary sector, as its policies continue to make it seem, at least, uh, that the UK is not a welcoming place for people to come uh, to live, work and study. Um, I want to be absolutely clear that international students make a valuable contribution to our campuses, to our society, culture and indeed to our economy. Uh, every year, I think more than 60,000 students from around 180 countries uh, study in Scotland and we should continue uh, to welcome and encourage that. Julian Martin. Thank the First Minister for that answer and the proposals that seem to be outlined by the Prime Minister seem at odds with, with the, the positive aspects of, of universities that she's just outlined. Universities UK, um, which represents most Scottish universities, said that international students make a net positive contribution of £25.9 billion to the UK economy and are the source of 70% of education export earnings. Can the First Minister give an initial assessment of the economic impact um, any reduction in uh, student visas from the UK Government could have on Scotland's economy? And in a time where Tory and Labour-backed Brexit has already had a devastating impact on research collaboration between our Scottish universities and their EU counterparts, how might this uh, also impact remaining international collaborations and crucially, what can we do in Scotland to safeguard our universities from reckless UK plans like this? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, restricting the ability of international students to come uh, to study in Scotland will have an adverse impact on our education institutions, I think on our society, which is more uh, diverse and vibrant because of that contribution, and uh, it will have an adverse impact on our economy as well. I mean, let me uh, just quote uh, the Director of Universities 
uh, Scotland uh, when he said uh, very recently in, in recent days any attempts to cut international student numbers at Scottish universities would be damaging to universities and the Scottish economy. Uh, every year more than 65,000 students from more than 180 countries study in Scotland. This diversity brings significant advantages to both our students and the wider university community as well as generating a £1.94 billion net contribution to the Scottish economy. Uh, that is why we need to do everything we can uh, to make it possible for people to come uh, to live, work and study in Scotland. Uh, Brexit is making that more difficult, uh, as it is making many things more difficult, and we need to uh, find a way back into the heart of the European Union. And to answer Gillian Martin's last question, the only way now for Scotland to do that, given the Tories, uh, Labour and the Liberals uh, seem to support uh, the UK being outside of the European Union. The only way for Scotland to get back in is by becoming an independent member of the European Union. Question number five, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, presiding officer, to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will mark the United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities. First Minister. Uh, the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities is a very important day. It highlights that disabled people continue to experience inequality and barriers. Uh, as a mark of respect for the day uh, and to help promote it, the Scottish Government will be lighting up St Andrew's House and Victoria Quay in uh, purple. Uh, we also provide £5 million to support disabled people's organisations to tackle inequality and discrimination and promote the rights of disabled people. And of course, we've committed to incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into Scots law. Uh, all of us, I know, want to ensure that disabled people benefit from all uh, that we are doing to improve the lives of people and to achieve equality for all. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the First Minister for a very positive answer? First Minister, I am lodging my final proposal to establish a disability commissioner for Scotland next Tuesday, a, an individual who will act as a champion for disabled community, for all disabled people. What better way to celebrate International Day of Persons with Disabilities than by you committing to supporting my proposal? Will your government support it? First Minister. I, I do want to try and give a, a positive uh, answer here. Of course, we need to see the detail and, and the uh, consultation responses when those are published uh, and see the detail of the bill when it's introduced. As I've said in other contexts, it's not possible for any government to uh, give a commitment to support a bill before it's actually seen uh, the bill. But I know the Equalities Minister has agreed to meet uh, with Mr Balfour uh, to establish the, the details of the proposals and we will certainly uh, look uh, as favourably as we can on that because I absolutely recognise uh, the sentiments behind the proposals for a disability commissioner. In saying that, though, I think it's also important, and I'm sure Jeremy Balfour would... Uh, share uh, these views too, that we need to uh, underline and remind people that there are existing commissions uh, to support and protect the rights of disabled people. The Scottish Human Rights Commission, the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission already play a role in relation to the rights of disabled people and in respect uh, of, of that uh, as uh, of age as a protected equality uh, characteristic. So there are existing mechanisms, uh, but of course we should consider uh, fully uh, the proposal for a disability commissioner that I know the member will shortly bring forward. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. In 2018, Scope found that disabled people in Scotland spent on average £632 a month on disability-related expenses, things like taxes, increased use of heating, special equipment and care costs. One in five disabled adults face additional costs of over £1,000, and almost a quarter of families with disabled children are facing similar costs. Given the current cost of living crisis, will the Scottish Government consider commissioning an update to this research? First Minister. Uh, yes, I'm happy to give that consideration. I also uh, recognise the reality for people with disabilities that Pam Duncan Glancy has uh, narrated in the Chamber today. Uh, and of course, we have already uh, taken steps uh, to implement uh, a Fader Scotland for Disabled People, the, the strategy that we have had in place. So over the five years of that delivery plan, we have, for example, uh, increased the number involved in choosing and controlling uh, social care support through self-directed support. Uh, we uh, have also seen Fair Start Scotland helping more than 9,000 people into employment. We've established a new child disability payment to replace disability living allowance, establishing a new adult disability payment uh, to replace 
PIP and of course uh, we're introducing a brand new child winter heating assistance benefit uh, which will only be available here in Scotland. So there is work that we have done but there is much more uh, that all governments need to look to do and of course having uh, research to underpin and inform that work is also always important so I will certainly uh, look carefully at that suggestion. Question number six, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an urgent update on its discussions with the EIS after the announcement of new strike dates. First Minister. Well, can I say, first of all, these are really difficult times for everyone. That, of course, includes those uh, who work across the, the different parts of our public sector, and that includes uh, teachers. It's also a difficult time uh, for public spending because of the inflationary impact on the Scottish Government's uh, budget. And it's in that context uh, that I say a fair pay offer has been made uh, to teachers. Uh, that's been made as appropriate through the Scottish Negotiating Committee for teachers. Um, it is of course the case that industrial action is in no one's interest. It is not in the interest of teachers. It's certainly not in the interest of pupils, parents uh, or carers either, who have already of course faced significant disruption over the past three years. Uh, the Education Secretary is in regular dialogue with all of our teacher unions um, and spoke with the EIS General Secretary uh, most recently last Friday. Uh, these discussions are, of course, ongoing, although the Chamber will be aware uh, that only COSLA, as the employer, can make a formal pay offer to the teacher unions uh, through the SNCT. Uh, the Scottish Government does not negotiate separately with unions on teachers' pay. Michael Mara. President officer, the offer that the First Minister has described, so that was rejected by teaching un unions, was made at the last possible moment. It had sat on the Cabinet Secretary's desk for over three weeks. And since the announcement of 16 more EIS strike dates, which will close our schools, deprive our children of their education and throw family life into chaos, no dates for negotiation have been sought or fixed. Next week, the SSTA and NASUWT will strike, closing schools again. No attempt has been made to avert that action by this government. President officer, our children have lost so much in the pandemic years. How can they afford a government making so little effort to keep their schools open? First Minister. Well, that's just frankly not the case. The offer that was made to uh, teacher unions last week was the fourth offer uh, that has gone to unions. And I think anybody looks at this government, and uh, bear in mind the point I made about the Scottish Government not uh, negotiating separately with unions, it's uh, through the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers. But anybody who has looked at the efforts this government has made uh, to give fair pay rises and settle any potential for industrial action with the wider local government workforce, with the NHS workforce, will know that this is a government, I think in contrast with other governments in other parts of the UK, uh, that is going to every length possible uh, to reach fair agreements with our public sector uh, trade unions. Looking at the offer made to teachers, uh, again, the fourth offer which has been made recognises the impact on, of the cost crisis on lower paid teachers in particular, with an increase of up to 6.85% uh, for them. The offer is the same as the offer that has already been accepted by other local government uh, workers. And, you know, I uh, have nothing but admiration for our teaching profession. They are uh, rightly paid higher than other uh, workers in, in other parts of the local government workforce. Uh, but the offer in terms of a pay increase that has been made to teachers is the same as that already accepted by the janitor in a school or by the dinner lady working in a school. So it is a fair offer. If accepted, it would mean that since 2018, teachers have had a 21.8% cumulative pay increase. And lastly, presiding officer, uh, we have the highest starting salary in the UK for a fully qualified uh, teacher under this new uh, and latest offer, a newly qualified teacher in Scotland would receive uh, seven thousand four hundred pounds more than counterparts in England. Our most experienced classroom teachers uh, get five thousand six hundred pounds more than if they were teaching in England on the main pay range. Uh, so we, I think, our Briefly record First shows uh, our commitment to teachers, um, and I really hope this is an offer that will be accepted in the interest of teachers and pupils across the country. Stephanie Callaghan. President officer, the First Minister has noted already that strikes are in no one's best interest, not teachers and certainly not pupils. 
Does the First Minister agree that on a fixed budget the Scottish Government has been put in an impossible position by the UK Government with no additional support forthcoming to fund pay offers or mitigate the impacts of inflation? First Minister. Well, that's, that's a statement of fact and it is important. It's a statement of fact. It's important to remember that current pay negotiations are for this financial year. And in this financial year, the Scottish Government's budget has been eroded to the tune of £1.7 billion by inflation. And not an additional penny extra has been provided to help deal with that. But we're not standing by and doing nothing. We are working really hard to give our public sector workers a fair pay deal. Take the NHS offer that NHS unions are currently considering, an average of 7.5%. In England, under the Conservatives, in Wales, under Labour, the offer to the NHS is 4.5% on average. So we are doing everything we can to get every penny possible uh, into the pockets of public sector workers, because that's the kind of government we are. That's our values. But yes, we do have a fixed budget, and it's been eroded because of Tory government incompetence. Willie Rennie. So, so that's the message to teachers. Just be grateful. You've had your lot. You're paid enough. That's not the way to, teach, to treat teachers in this country. Playing one set of workers against another is a disgraceful way to treat those people who taught our young people through the pandemic. Isn't it about time that instead of making last-minute offers, hours before the strike deadline, that she treated teachers with the respect that they are due, and gave them a decent pay offer with a budget that she has got. First Minister. I know Willie Rennie doesn't get much attention these days, but even by his standards, that was a pretty shameful, shameful tone to take on an issue that is so important to teachers, pupils and parents across the country. Let me set out again the way in which we are approaching this. An offer uh, this year uh, that uh, recognises the impact of the cost crisis on the lowest paid teachers and an offer that is as fair and gives as much of an increase to teachers as the janitor and the uh, dinner lady has already accepted. In a fixed budget, part of what we've got to try to do is to be fair across all parts of the public sector and that is what we are seeking to do. Secondly, an offer that if accepted would mean that since 2018 uh, teachers would have had a 21.8% cumulative pay increase and I think they deserve every penny of it and uh, an outcome that would mean that our teachers are paid better than teachers in other parts of the UK. Highest starting salary, not just in the UK, the OECD found that starting salaries for teachers in Scotland are 17% above the EU average eh, at primary level. So that's how much we value teachers. Within a fixed budget, we are doing everything possible to get every penny possible into the pockets of public sector workers. Um, and that's the right thing to do. And that eh, tone, frankly, I think will be seen for what it was by people across Scotland. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to build on the enduring legacy of Doddy Weir and support efforts to cure MND and similar neurological conditions. First Minister. Well, as uh, we've been reflecting earlier today, Doddy Weir was a Scottish sporting legend and as a human being, I think he was in so many ways one of a kind. Uh, he was a hero uh, of rugby, but off the pitch, the way he responded to his MND diagnosis was truly inspirational. He campaigned tirelessly to increase awareness of this cruel condition, uh, as well as raising money for research through his foundation in the hope that a cure uh, will be found so that others coming after him uh, would benefit from that. Uh, we and I suspect I'm not just speaking for the government here, I'm speaking for everybody across the chamber. We share Doddy's vision of a world without MND. Since 2015, and this has been inspired, and I think it is important to say it, uh, much of the work uh, we did uh, after 2015 was inspired by the campaigning uh, of the late Gordon Aikman, who also uh, deserves great credit here. But we have invested... 
around £700,000 in research uh, looking at, at the progression of the condition and the development of a pipeline for new treatments. Uh, we've also doubled the number of MND specialist nurses across the country and ensured that they're funded now from uh, and by the NHS. And we're currently implementing the neurological care and support framework to ensure that everyone with a neurological condition such as MND can access the coordinated and high quality care that they need. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? And I think to say that Doddy was a unique individual certainly undersells him. I don't think we should forget that he was a world-class sportsman, but it is his indomitable character and the way he tackled his diagnosis of MND head-on that will endure. And he certainly showed us how to live your best life. As many have said, you could not fail to like him if you met him and be inspired by him. And certainly I can think of no one who could possibly achieve what he has. And along with Rob Burroughs, he has brought the search for treatment and cure of MND into everyone's thoughts. And I'm very welcome to hear the First Minister mention the work of Gordon Aitman before that. The UK Government have pledged £50 million to help uh, in the search for MND treatments. And although the messages are positive, can I ask the First Minister and the Chamber to unify as a Parliament to encourage the UK Government to move quicker? And specifically, what will the Scottish Government do to work with charities like My Name's Doddy to tackle these horrible neurological conditions and keep up the momentum that the big man started? I think we, First Minister. We've, we've all mentioned you know, the practical uh, impact of the work Doddy uh, did and indeed Gordon uh, before him. But what always struck me about Doddy and Gordon uh, was the the courageous way in which they never allowed uh, that horrible condition and the diagnosis of it to, to dim their spirit um, and their love for and, and capacity for life. Uh, I think the last time I saw Dodie in person was at Murrayfield um, and his smile lit up the room. And, you know, that fortitude and resilience in the face of something that I don't think any of us really know how we would cope with is utterly inspirational. Um, and it united Doddy and, and Gordon, and in their memory, uh, we all have a duty uh, to go as far and as fast as we possibly can to find the cure for this condition. Uh, so yes, uh, I would encourage the UK government to, to go faster, but I also would say to my uh, government, we need to go uh, faster and do everything we can here, and we need to work together. We already work closely with uh, charitable organisations, and we will continue uh, to do that. Uh, there are positive signs, uh, thanks to the research that is being uh, done, uh, but we need to make sure that we support uh, those who have the skills and the expertise to find the cure, that they have uh, all of the, the necessary support and resources to do that. And I pledge today, uh, in memory of the, the great Doddy Weir, uh, that the government I lead will continue to do all we can to find the cure that he so desperately wanted. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. I would say that I regret that I've been unable to call any general or constituency questions today, due largely to the length of some exchanges. And I will review today's exchanges to ensure that more members are able to participate in this session each week. Thank you. There will be a brief suspension to allow members and the public gallery um, before we to leave before we move on to members' business.